in terms of also sort of dedicating yourself and sacrificing to what you want to do, if I wind the clock back even previously, when I, I mentioned that when you're doing your general training, um, you, you, do, you do your first degree and then you have to work for a couple of years before you apply. So obviously I wanted to strengthen my application. And this is an example of, you know, when you commit yourself, commit and just do what it takes for it to work. I decided to obviously look for a job for those, those two years and I was thinking maybe I could work in a general practitioner who dabbled in a little bit of orthodontics so that when time came for me to apply, I could strengthen my application. I was lucky enough to get an interview with a very high profile, well-known specialist and he offered me the job. So I thought this is even better than working for a general practitioner who dabbles. I'm now working for an actual specialist. I was super excited. I said, I'm going to impress this guy. I'm going to absolutely work really, really hard. And um, at the end of the two years, I'm going to get a reference from him and I'm going to apply to the program and I'm going to get him. <clears throat> that was the aim. So I get the job and I'm super excited. I go back home and I said, hey, he's actually during, at the end of the interview, offered me the job. This is brilliant. Euphoria settled and then I, I remember speaking to my dad, I said, yeah, but he hasn't spoken to me about pay or anything. And my dad said, listen, don't worry about it. I'm sure you'll get paid, whatever. And I really wasn't that, that, that fussed at that point in time. I was just excited to get this job. I'd been at uni for five years and now I've got a job. So I start working. I was not paid in that role or paid for that job for the two years I was there. So now, I mean, I'm obviously a very different person now. So the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the 2003 version of me is very different to the 2020 version of me. So I, now I would have been more assertive about things, but I was too scared to go and ask because I thought if I asked and I lost my job, that was my fear. I wouldn't get the reference and that would then hinder me gaining entry into the specialist training program. Mm -hmm. So when I tell that to people, you know, they're bit, I see everything. I've seen reactions from shock to indignation to anger, people feeling angry on my behalf. And I tell them I absolutely 100% do not resent it at all. Was I exploited? Yes. Was I used? Yes. But it was a challenge on my path that I needed to overcome. So think about it mentally. You're working really hard to impress someone for a couple of years and you're not getting paid for it. That does take some mental discipline to process all the emotions and everything that goes with that. But I was, had the absolute ability to completely compartmentalize it. That then obviously flowed on to more difficulty when I finished my specialist training because what you usually do is you work for, the, for, for a few years before you apply, save some money so that once you're through, you've got something to fall back on. But I, I didn't have any of that. Right. So, but I, I have absolutely no regrets about the decision I made because it proved to me that if I was willing to go through that, um, it was something that meant a lot. And I was absolutely tunnel vision focused on achieving what I wanted to achieve. And I wanted to do things quickly. I, I was never been somebody to let something just sit and get postponed and play out over time. Um, I, I like to force the issue, force the agenda and get things moving. It's just intrinsic to my personality and I think it comes out clearly in the hobbies that I like. Um, speed for me is key because it's very, I, I've, I've rarely seen anyone who has experienced a high degree of success in their life who by their very nature is a slow person. Okay, it seems that to me that that urgency and that efficiency is something that's key. That doesn't mean you don't have long-term plans, but it means you are rapidly working towards them. It's no point saying, yeah, in 10 years I wanna be here and then you spend two months watching Netflix every night, just dreaming about it. It may be that the fastest you can get there is a 10-year plan, but you're urgently working on it for every single moment for that decade or whatever it may be. That also brings me to another sort of, you know, when I, I mentioned about this, a couple of things that r really irritate me and I probably won't choose to spend time with you <laughs> exhibit these characteristics. Um, one, we mentioned people who squander opportunity. It, it actually does at, at times, it, it frustrates me because I think how many people are there in the world that would have done anything 
would have been desperate for that opportunity to pursue success. They're not, it's not a sure bet they'll get it, but just for that chance, what would they have done? And you've been given it and you've been casual with it or let it slide or not appreciate it. I also think it shows a complete lack of respect for people who've come before you. If you've been given an opportunity, that's your good luck. That's the cards you've been dealt. No one should begrudge anyone who's been given opportunity. They should be judged on what they do with it. Right? So I don't like it when people say, oh, well, he's so successful because, you know, his dad or his mum did something for him. That's fine. He was born into that family that could provide him with that. I don't have any issue with that at all. Right? I'm happy for someone to have that sort of opportunity. But I'm then going to make my decisions on what I assess that individual and what he's done with it. Did his dad get here or did his mum get here and then he or she has now taken it to another level? That's a huge success story because they've elevated everything. Or did they stagnate or did they, you know, let things go by the wayside? That's a very, very different circumstance. Well, is that why from your end you decided to start your own practice? Because I think that's a very key thing mm -hmm. is, that, um, is that you had a dis like the, unless you had already decided on this, but there may be someone sitting there where they're, going, hey, do I just work under someone else for the rest of my life where you've built up this, um, this uh, specialization, yet you then have the opportunity to just go work under someone else. You you absolutely, you have, no, I'll, I'll, so. I'll tell you why. I think it's getting more and more popular um, for a variety of reasons to um, work for someone else. Mm. Uh, and it's amazing you said that because it was something I had in mind that we would speak about. Um, and the reason for that, when I ask people why, they bring up something which is said too commonly, work-life balance. How on earth are you going to achieve anything of significance or merit if it is an intrinsic part of your life? So what talk of balance? If you compartmentalize your work here and you compartmentalize your life here and you look at them as separate objects that need to be balanced on a scale, you will not be successful in either of them. Because by the very definition of trying to balance them, you are compromising. Now that's just hard, cold, logical fact. You cannot argue, the counter argument for that is porous. What you're telling me is you don't like it when it gets hard and difficult and mean and nasty and there's a ton of crap you're going through. And because it's that difficult and hard, you want to retreat to a safe space. And that means I want to leave work at the door when I, when I leave the office or whatever it may be that you're doing and go back home and balance or go to Byron or whatever it is that you do, right? You're not going to be great at anything. You're not going to be good at anything unless it is a part of your life every moment. Take an example of an athlete. How many Olympians do you think don't live, breathe, eat their sport? How do you get that good? Do you think that they'd say, well, when I'm training for six hours, that's fine, but you know what? I don't want to do that extra session because my legs are sore and I need some work-life balance. <laughs> no. Right? They're not going to be on the Olympic team. Forget about getting a medal or anything like that. I mean, they're going to be distinctively average, regardless of the talent they have. Because there's going to be someone else who's going to run till their legs are jelly and then go back home and look at footage and analyze and talk to the coaches and everything else or rest or do whatever nutrition or whatever they need to do physically to come back the next morning and, and, and do it again. There, so there is a huge amount of satisfaction in creating something and seeing it grow and becoming successful. And I think if I, uh, if I didn't pursue that and see that process through, it would have been psychologically devastating for me. Absolutely. I would always, that would have been a, something that I considered a key failure. So, I mean, my perspective on this is going to seem quite 
rigid and quite harsh and you know, quite extreme. But I'm still yet to be convinced by people saying that I want to take a gentle approach to things and I want to take it, make it, you know, I want to balance aspects of my life and be successful. Now, this is going to be misinterpreted, so I need to clarify this. This does not mean you absolve your obligations in whatever personal roles you have. So whether that's with your partner or you know, if you're engaged or married or girlfriend or if you're a parent, I'm not saying that. You have to bring the same intensity in all areas. That's what you mean by, because I was watching, was like for those who want to jump on the Instagram page, when you two had the interview in the car, you mentioned that. And I watched it back a few times and each time I, I got a different perspective from it. But now I finally get what you mean, is that whole thing of that same intensity you bring into your own business and striving towards that. Yeah, you bring that into each area of your life. And yeah, it's not like... So it's not a matter of balancing anything, yeah. right? You're bringing 100% to everything you do. Now, why do people fall into fall short of what, like how many times have you seen people with potential and they, you think, geez, that's the next superstar and things don't quite work out. Mm. Or you see somebody who hasn't impressed you and then the next time they're on your radar, they are completely different, proficient, and you're thinking, where did that come from? Right, we've all had that experience yeah. because, you know, there was, a, a, the, there was a late professor at Carnegie Mellon in the US. His name was Randy Pausch and poor fellow passed away a few years, I think it might be several years ago now, pancreatic cancer. But towards the end of his life, uh, he became a little bit more prominent in the media and he, he wrote a book, but he had the concept of walls. So there was a few things he said which rung true with me. And some things that I've taken into my own, you know, into my own life as well as into my own practice being a boss and, you know, I've got a team of 30 now. If you give people enough time, they'll impress you. So what that means is you pick the right people, then give them rope to impress you, right? But they have to be dedicated. The second thing that he mentioned was there will be barriers set up. It seems like that's the way the universe is built because... It's the way, it's nature's way that the most deserving get the price, right? Darwinism and evolution is, is exactly that. Those most fit propagate the survival of the species. Yeah. So when you put these barriers up to make it hard, of course things that are worthy of achieving are hard by their definition because then if it was easy and everybody had it, it doesn't become special. And I'm not saying we need to be selfish with our success. You need to share it. But you're only deserving of it if it's been challenging because it needs to test you. So that aspect of being able to push yourself and then focus on the task at hand and just go after it without needing to take a break from it, without needing to balance, oh, this is intense, I need to duck off for a while and just forget. I have no problem about anyone. I'm not saying don't go on a holiday. I like going on holidays. But I can promise you I don't leave my intensity for what I do as a profession or in any other area of my life aside and put it in a drawer and close it and then I go on holiday and I'm a different person. So if you want something badly enough and you want to be proficient at it, it has to literally be in every cell in your body. So... The answer to your question, why do many people become associates? The answer I get a lot is, um, you know, work-life balance. Having said that, a lot of the clinicians I've admired, we've all been associates at some point in time, okay? Because the, but there's always been that ambition to pilot your own ship. Everyone's path's different, but for me, that was something that was very, very important. And it's worked out very, very well for me. I would not be in the situation I am now or the position I'm in now if I remained um, um, working for someone. I think that's a really, really good point to, to end on in a way, is that we've, we've got this prize that you've, you've mentioned things here that soon enough is going to be another car, which we are 
Shall we reveal what the... Well, you already revealed what that I think I might mention earlier. Yeah. So yeah. There's Could actually, you mention that earlier? Well, there's actually a couple which have now been updated that... Well, we, the 765LT apparently has been built in December. Yeah. So they're telling me a February uh, delivery, unless McLaren, you're kind enough to air freight it. <laughs> but, he, does, um, he doesn't like to <laughs> I'm impatient. Please air freight it. <laughs> um, um, and please, exactly. please don't send me the bill. <laughs> um, and uh, I've also ordered a facelift E63S AMG. So that's also scheduled for March, uh, February, March delivery. So first quarter of next year is going to be going to be busy with the garage uh, changing over a little bit. So we're, we're, we're excited about that. Mm -hmm.